and brings to the table. And this really is exemplified and brought to, to fruition through the works and the writings of one French philosopher by the name of René Descartes. And Descartes is the one who really is the father of modern philosophy, where he, he puts philosophy on a path where it's divorced from reality and really embraces skepticism. Really, Descartes was, was focused on the question of how do we know we exist? Among philosophers during his time, there was this great debate of knowledge, and basically there was a lot of doubt, and people came to believe that you could doubt, that everything was in doubt, there was nothing that was certain. And so what Descartes wanted to do is he wanted to try to bring certitude and certainty to philosophy, and especially concerning this question of how do we know we exist? So he said that really if we believe, if we doubt everything, then nothing is assumed to be certain. And so then he went on to further say, if everything is in doubt, then the only certainty is that we doubt. So the only certain, clear, and distinct idea that cannot be doubted is that, is I think, therefore I am, is what Descartes came up with. He said, if we doubt everything, nothing is known to be certain. And the only thing that we do know is that we're thinking. If we're thinking, then we obviously must exist. And so this is how we try to bring some kind of closure to this whole discussion of knowledge with these enlightened philosophers. But as we can see, that really doesn't answer the question. It brings up more questions than it does answers, and it really leads towards the path of skepticism. So the enlightenment really begins to play and bring to effect within the church and also within Western European society and Western civilization as a whole, this loss of authentic truth and a loss of authentic faith and a, and a realization that we really can't know anything that skepticism reigns supreme. If we begin to lose a sense of our authentic truth and of authentic faith, then it's, it's a short move, it's a short uh, move away from then an understanding of our authentic story and an understanding of why our civilization exists and what our civilization is supposed to do. Our great late Holy Father, John Paul II, wrote a book, it's actually the book published right before he died in 2005, called Memory and Identity. And in this book, the Holy Father gives us a great understanding, his understanding of what happens in philosophy during, what happened in philosophy during this period of time of the Enlightenment, and what its effects really are for the church and Western society as a whole. And this is what he said. He said, the entire drama of salvation history had disappeared as far as the Enlightenment was concerned. Man remained alone, alone as creator of his own history and his own civilization, alone as one who decides what is good and what is bad as one who would exist and operate even if there were no God. So our Holy Father really formulates here for us this understanding that I've said that the, the faith, or that Europe rather, is moving away from the faith during this period of time. Just, just going away, disembarking from her Christian roots, no longer acknowledging the role that the church and faith has, not only in Western society, but in the lives of each individual person. Right? Like as our Holy Father says, that the enlightened man lives as one who decides what is good and what is bad. Right? Do we experience that in our modern world today? We, can just, we have so many people that we probably meet. We see it on, on the news all the time. People deciding for themselves what they think is good and what they think is bad. There's no sense, or there's a lack of a sense of understanding of an objective God-given truth. And this is what happens when we separate ourselves from the faith and from the, really the church that built up our society and our civilization. So as I said in our last time period, really what happens is man moves from a God-centered view of society to a man-centered view of society and focuses on himself and on his ability to create whatever he wants, to decide what is good, decide what is bad, and to do away with institutions that they no longer think are important or needed. Really, ultimately, the Enlightenment is a rejection of Christ and the church. And so we have as one of our prime proponents of enlightened thinking during the 17th century and 18th century is a man by the name of Voltaire. And Voltaire actually waged a fierce campaign of satire and ridicule against the Catholic Church. He wrote many pamphlets and treatises and books against the church. He was one of the authors of what was known in France as the Encyclopedia, which was a collection of, which was a collection of articles by enlightened thinkers on numerous subjects. Many of these articles were, were, were attacks against the faith, and attacks against the Catholic Church in particular. Ironically enough, Voltaire was educated by the Jesuits, so he received a very good education and used the, the skills and tools that the Jesuits had given him to reason, unfortunately not for the Church, but against the Church. Now Voltaire, despite his education from the Jesuits, he wanted to have the Jesuits suppressed. 
And so we have in our time period of revolutions and modernism, it's a great and, and really difficult event in church history that impacted the church and impacted Western civilization as a whole, and this is the suppression of the Jesuits, the Jesuit order, that great order founded by St. Ignatius Loyola to help implement the reform decrees of the Council of Trent is actually suppressed and no longer allowed to, to be in existence during this time period of church history. And the reason, there are two reasons really why the enlightened thinkers, Voltaire among them, wanted the Jesuits suppressed. And the two reasons are this. One, is that they were an obstacle to the anti-Christian movement, the whole anti-Christian movement of the Enlightenment, because of their educational system. The Jesuits, one of their main apostolates was to form schools, universities, and at this time in Europe, they had an extensive educational system. At the end of the 17th century, there were 23, roughly 23,000 Jesuits. And they operated in 670 colleges throughout Europe and 176 seminaries. So they had an extensive educational system. And if you think about it, if you're an enlightened thinker, a philosopher, and you want to change the entire way in which society believes and thinks, and you want to separate it, from what it has known for the last you know, 1,800 years, 1,700 years, how do you do that? You have to take control of the educational system. You have to take, you have to, in order for your new idea to be pervasive and for, for your new idea to be spread, you must control the educational system. And so that's what these enlightened thinkers wanted to do. And the main obstacle for their ability to do that were, was the Jesuit order. Voltaire knew that if he destroyed the Jesuits, then the church would soon follow. He knew that the loyalty of the Jesuits and, the, and their, their educational system really was kind of the bulwark of, of the Catholic Church. And if he took away that foundation, took away that order, it wouldn't be long before the church herself fell. He even said, once we have destroyed the Jesuits, we shall have our own way with the infamous thing, which is what he called the church. When the Jesuits are suppressed in 20 years, he prophesied there will be nothing left of the church. And he wrote that in 1773. Interestingly enough, 20 years later, in 1793, the Fran in France, the Catholic Church was actually outlawed and ceased to exist. So and we'll see how that happens here in a minute, but his prophecy became true. So and Voltaire and his enlightened group of thinkers wanted to suppress the Jesuits because they were an obstacle to his movement and his grabbing control of the educational system. Also, they wanted the Jesuits suppressed because they were an obstacle to the central authority of the state. You have a group of Jesuits or a very well-to-do and influential group, religious group in your country, and you're an absolutist king or a king with a desire to have an absolute reign in your country. You know that this group is loyal to the Holy Father. They're not loyal to you. So they're loyal to, in your mind, a foreign power. So in order to gain absolute control over your state, you've got to get rid of this religious order. So it's the second reason why they wanted the, the Jesuits suppressed. The Jesuits are first suppressed in France. In 1761, the government issues a decree prohibiting French subjects from actually entering the Jesuit order, banned Jesuits from all theological teaching in France, and also prohibited Frenchmen from, from uh, going or attending Jesuit <coughs> school. Finally, in 1764, the monarch of France, King Louis XV, outlawed the Jesuits and said that they could not exist in France itself. Next, the Jesuits come under attack in their home country of Spain. In April of 1767, King Charles III suppressed the Jesuits in Spain and ordered their expulsion from Spain itself and all of Spain's colonial territories. So 6,000 Jesuits in Spain had to flee, were exiled, and deported and over 2,500 Jesuits existed and operated and missioned in colonial areas controlled by Spain, and they had to leave as well. So now the Jesuits are no longer welcomed, no longer allowed even to exist in the country of their founder. Unfortunately, France and Spain didn't just stop it at outlawing the Jesuits in their own country. They wanted a complete suppression of the order throughout the church, and they began to, with political maneuvering and strong-arm tactics, try to get the Holy Father to suppress the order which unfortunately they were successful in doing. Pope Clement XIV, under pressure from, the, from France and Spain in 1773, issues an order to suppress the Jesuit, the Society of Jesus, to suppress the Jesuit order. So the Jesuits are no, now no longer able to actually be in existence in the church. This great order that was founded a time period ago in the Catholic Reformation to reform the church and to help implement the decrees of the Council of Trent is now 
no longer allowed to even exist by order of the Pope. Eventually, they would be suppressed for an entire generation, for 40 years, well, 41 years, really, until Pope Pius VII in 1814 brought them back and reestablished the order. So this, and this actually is a very important thing for us to remember, the suppression of the Jesuits, because it leads or helps lead to the embracing of enlightened ideas and thoughts in France and leads to that dramatic and horrific event in history, the French Revolution. So the French Revolution really is, is the climax of the Enlightenment. It's really, it really brings about what the enlightened thinkers wanted, a society separate from the church, a society that even, did not even recognize the church or the, the roots of Europe linked to the church. Louis XVI is king of France during this time. In the 18th century, he's a devout Catholic, but he is afflicted by chronic indecision. So although he's, he's a good king, has a good heart, he's unable really to make good decisions. He was a weak leader. He was married to Marie Antoinette, who herself was also a very devout Catholic. They clashed, where King Louis began to clash with the powerful, the increasingly powerful and wealthy nobility in France. And everything came to a head in France in 1789 during a financial crisis that erupted throughout the country. And one of the main reasons why France entered into a financial crisis here in the late 18th century is because of their, their support and their aid, monetarily and otherwise, to America, to the United States of America during the United States' war of independence from Great Britain. So France entered into a decline, a, a period of financial decline, and created a crisis in the country, and eventually then caused the revolution, which happened on July 14th, 1789. Revolutionary elements stormed the Bastille in Paris, and the Bastille came to be seen as the symbol of King Louis' autocratic and dictatorial power. And when they stormed these revolutionaries and rebels, when they stormed the Bastille, they were hoping to free all these prisoners inside. When they got into the Bastille, they found that there were only seven prisoners in the entire prison. Of the seven, four were there because they were forgers. One was charged with incense or incest, and another one, or two others, were insane. And one of the prisoners actually believed he was God. So this great revolution to free and liberate the people, really all they ended up freeing were forgers, a, a criminal, and two people who were insane. Eventually, in the fall of 1789, the royal family was, was held in captivity, was captured and then held in captivity by these revolutionary elements, and they were eventually overthrown officially in the year 1792. Now, during the king's captivity, the revolutionaries began the total dismantling of the faith in in, uh, in France, the church in France. And one of the things that they do in 1790 is they pass a law known as the Civil Constitution of the Clergy. And the Civil Constitution of the Clergy really was an effort to separate the church in France from the church in Rome, from the Catholic Church. The government was to assume control of the church, so it would be a government-run organization. The bishops would be elected by the people, not appointed by the Pope. And all clergy were forced or had to take an oath of fidelity to the new government. Now it's interesting, in France, this, was, this is somewhat similar to what we saw in England, is it not? When Henry VIII tried to take over the church, and declared himself the supreme head of the church in England, he required also an oath of the, especially of the priests and religious houses throughout England, and actually all people were liable to take the oath, the oath of supremacy, recognizing him as the head of the church. So we've seen this before, this oath of the governments require for the church's clergy to take. Now, interestingly, in France, it was a different story than what happened in England. In England, we saw, remember, how there were 300 bishops in and, and, and a whole country, and only one supported Catherine of Aragon and her claim that her marriage to Henry was valid. There were 299 who sided with Henry and took the oath. In France, much different story. Only six of the 134 bishops took the oath to the government. So the bishops in France maintained the faith and held on to the authentic faith and held on to their loyalty to the Holy Father. Now, on the other side with the priests, it's estimated about 45% of the priests did take the oath. So the priests were about half. But they had as their, as their heads, their leaders, the bishops who maintained their faith. Now, in the year 1792, the reign of terror begins in France, where Madame Guillotine is established and the revolutionaries begin to execute any and all who crossed their paths. We have in the month of September 1792, great martyrs of the church. More than 200 priests and religious were martyred in one day in September of 1792 for refusing to take the oath. So now again, 
Just like we saw in England under Elizabeth, we see a European nation, a Catholic nation, now begin to persecute actively the church and enter into a government-sponsored and sanctioned violent persecution of Catholics. As a whole, in September of 1792, there were more than 1,400 people killed by Madame Guillotine. Actually, there was in the same year a Catholic uprising. Catholics revolted. Catholics in the, in the region of France known as the Vendée revolted against the revolutionary government, tried to restore order and restore um, the, the faith to their region. They were ultimately violently suppressed and put down. The height of the terror is reached in 1793. In January of that year, Louis XVI is executed. In October of 1793, Marie Antoinette is executed. So now, now lo, not only are the French revolutionaries attacking the church and persecuting Catholics, but now they actually commit regicide and kill their monarchs. The country then begins, the revolutionary government then begins this, a severe persecution of the church. It picks up in intensity in this year of 1793, and they embark on a process of a complete de-Christianization of the entire country of France. They change the Gregorian calendar, the calendar that we use and operate with today, to a calendar of reason. They actually change the week from seven days to ten days. They change the names of the days of the week as a result as well. They also turn churches into temples of reason. We even have an account of a prostitute who was brought to the Cathedral of Notre Dame and was placed on the altar and crowned the goddess of reason. So we have great, horrible, blasphemous acts taking place in the eldest daughter of the church, France, during this French Revolution. The state then also initiates a cult of reason, a cult of, uh, the, supreme, or the cult of nature, and a cult of the state. Again, a move, trying to get people to move away from worshiping God and participating in the life of the church, and instead embracing uh, the worship of the state. We'll see this come into play later, too, in the history of Europe in the 20th century, when there are other governmental regimes that come to power and bring about a worship or a cult of the state. It's estimated that in, that in 1789, half of, or it's estimated by 1792, half the clergy in France were gone. Half the clergy of France were gone. They were either executed, or they fled, or they had left, or they became apostates and left the faith. And also during this period of time of the terror, there was no, there were no ordinations. There were no priests being ordained, no men being ordained priests in France. So the church in France is severely weakened and severely hurt by this, this great reign of terror. The reign of terror comes to an end because of the witness of 16 heroic women. 16 Carmelite nuns. In 1792, when the reign of terror began, they offered themselves as a holocaust to God and said, Lord, please, if it is your will, we offer our lives for an end to the terror. If it be your will, bring it about. Well, he answered their prayers two years later. In 1794, they were arrested, sent to Paris, ultimately convicted, sentenced to death, and were guillotined and killed. After their death, 10 days after their death, the reign of terror officially ended. So the reign of terror came to an end as a result of the Holocaust offered by the lives of these 16 Carmelite nuns. It's estimated that during the reign of terror and through the whole French Revolution, about 20,000 people in France were killed by the guillotine. So this was a time of great destruction, great death, where the eldest daughter of the church rips herself away from her foundation, rips herself away from an intimate relationship with the church, and it causes ramifications throughout all of Europe. And we'll continue that story and see what happens after the revolution in this period of revolution and modernism when we come back from this break. our time period of revolutions and modernism. Before the break, we just finished up a discussion, we're finishing our discussion of the French Revolution, and that period of time when the church was actively persecuted by the revolutionary government in France. We saw how the lives of 16 Carmelite martyrs actually ended the French Revolution. They gave their lives as a holocaust in order to, to bring about the end of the revolution in France and the end, rather, of the, of the persecution of the church and of others in France. And so now the, the French 
history changes with the arrival of Napoleon Bonaparte onto the scene. Napoleon comes to power in 1796, and like other monarchs and other secular rulers, 